Uh, welcome friends and enemies to the Forensic Focus podcast. Today with us we have a genuine rock star of uh, the digital forensic scene in the UK. Uh, I would say um, star of stage and screen. I think stage is upcoming when we talked on Wednesday. You were getting the um, uh, a local theatre troupe integration going with Southampton University. So the stage is yet to come, but I know you've been on TV. Um, but Professor Sarah Morris from Southampton University... Uh, head of the digital forensics practice there and setting up an amazing course, he says, unbiasedly being part of it. But there we go. There's nothing like free advertising. Um, but uh, in in the uh, in 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 the vein of um, things that we have both done previously, um, and we'll talk about that as we as we go ahead. So, thank you very much for joining us today. Really appreciate no, it. Thank you for having me. Um, so, I've, I've, I'm going to say it's a good it's a good introduction, but I'll let you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, yeah, go for it. Oh, um, okay. Well, I've been doing digital forensics over 15 years now. Started at Cranfield, learning under Tony and Brian. Um, did a PhD looking at data recovery of thumbnail caches, and then stayed on in academia. But I've been doing casework the whole time. And when I took over the unit, oh, years ago, um, I branched out into more civil intelligence, all, all sorts of things, including work in newspapers as well as criminal, which I found was good for the mental health of the team. And then about 10 months ago, <laughs> moved over to Southampton and we're developing a digital forensic capability here, which is fantastic. Now you have quite an interesting reputation in the field for being very good at dealing with weird things. Yeah. Um, I know that you've been involved in creating robots that search for digital evidence um, in a crime scene, and you're you're. We're, I know we're building a crime scene room. He says with full knowledge that his his partners do not have. Um. So so can you tell us tell us a little bit more about some of the and I'll give you free reign to talk about ones that you want to talk about here, because I know that you're sick to the back teeth of certain other things. Um, but, but can you tell us a bit about your interest in odd stuff? Odd things. Well, I, I think that came from being at Shrivenham and that Tony legacy of doing the things that no one else knew how to handle. Um, so ended up looking at the, you know, less run of the mill sausage factory cases and the, the things that people were struggling with or the things that were new and unusual. So ended up doing a wide variety of cases, including the infamous washing machine and the, the garage door in various bits like that, which are interesting, but not the most technically challenging cases I've had, just the most weird and unusual. Like, why are we using over 100 gigabytes of storage on a IoT garage door, and why are we creating bespoke file systems for these things? I mean, it's just weird. Um, and then moved into, and I think this all spanned from those cyber dogs, the electronic storage detection dogs, and really deciding that as a computer geek, there aren't many opportunities where we get to work with dogs, and wanting to work with a dog, as a dog lover. Um, and we were told no, can't have a dog so we built a robot instead to do electronic storage detection and trialed it in a variety of scenes uh, mostly corporate looking at how we could use it to create hotspot maps of the environment to save us time you know like every unit we were short on staff and we called him sneaky peaky version one and then we ended up with a more static version two called crafty fox and this is doing uh, sort of Wi-Fi, uh, sorry, not Wi-Fi, radio um, frequency-based stuff, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, a whole spectrum on the you know, on the comm side. Um, and it, it's been great, really, because since I've moved to Southampton, we've got an incredible range of comms experts and some absolutely phenomenal Faraday labs and anechoic chambers that we can work in to really enhance that capability. So we're... We're moving forward, looking at the the less obvious signals that are being emitted to see what we can do with those. I I was just interested. So you, when you first started talking about how you built the cyber dog to do some of the work for you, uh, like I I don't come from a background of 
uh, policing digital forensics or or, the, or that space at all. Did they have dogs that sniff out like hard drives and, and phones and stuff? Yeah, so oh, years ago now, they started in America having these electronic storage detection dogs and a you know, phenomenal opportunity. And I think it was Devon and Cornwall over here had the, the first ones in the UK. And we were absolutely fascinated. So we did some work with chemistry, uh, Professor Jackie Akavan's team, looking at the specific chemi chemicals that were being um, used by the dogs and that we could enhance for the trainers. So we did some work with local law enforcement about that. And it became clear that we could work with the dogs, but we were never going to get a dog of our own. So that's why we ended up with a robot. Less mess, less chaos. Right. That's fat. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. And you mentioned uh, also right at the start, um, you do all the, the weird things that a lot of people don't do, like uh, not sausage factories. Have you done a sausage factory before? <laughs> <laughs> or like a, a weird factory story that you have where you've had to go do digital forensics on some so weird place? So I have done forensics on a rock factory. You know the rock you get at Seaside, the long sticks? Um okay. So a small corporate job there. That was yeah. fascinating. I got far too excited though watching how they make the rock and how they build it up. But... <laughs> that is interesting. <laughs> it's when you get into those niche cases. They're good stories. That That's awesome. So, uh, brain, back on track. Um, we talk, are, we, are we okay to talk about some of the ongoing projects that we've got? Yeah, absolutely. Good. So... In the radio frequency sphere, um, there's uh, the Faraday bags. Now, this was a fascinating thing that, that sort of came up. We, oh, I mean, Desi, you know what a Faraday bag is, I'm sure. Um, but for the benefit of anybody mm -hmm. who doesn't, if you get a device which has a network uh, connection, um, wireless network connection, whether that's to the cellular network or to, uh, to Wi-Fi, uh, you wish to isolate it, but in in a physical way. Um, so, so you have these uh, things based around a, a piece of work by the physicist uh, Faraday, Michael Faraday. I can't remember. Um, and uh, it, effectively, it's a wire cage or a wire bag that you put things into, and then radio se frequency signals can't reach it. Um, and we use them a lot in law enforcement. We lose them, use them a lot for protecting um, devices. But there is a preconceived idea that you buy a bag and that it continues to do everything that it's supposed to do. Um, but like all bags, um, and you know, for those of us that have a gym bag that's been carried around a fair bit, you find that sooner or later the bottom falls out of it. In much the same way, uh, Sarah's been starting to do some research on what happens to a Faraday bag when it's been used a lot. Um, so, you know, can you can you tell us where we're going with that one? Yeah, sure. So it was an initial idea I had after working with, so the lovely Dr. John Painter at Cranfield, who does all the microscopy uh, bits there. And he was showing me about material failures and how it's not always obvious to the naked eye that materials have failed. And at the same time, we had reusable Faraday bags coming in for environmental and resource reasons. And it struck me that we weren't actually on the ground testing and looking at those. So, yeah, John and I, with uh, Melissa Hadjikis, we did a pilot study earlier this year looking at some basics. And it turned out the initial assumptions that a lot of the failures were going to happen where we couldn't detect them um, with the naked eye were, was, was valid and we saw a lot of ways that the bags could be damaged and it just wasn't being picked up. So this further study that we're doing at Southampton is really utilising those wonderful labs we've got in the high power voltage with the anechoic chambers and the Faraday environments to look at using mock cellular towers to do a more advanced rig so that we can really strength test those bags. But not only that, create a small unit that law enforcement can take away that does these tests automatically that they can stick in a bag even if they don't have a Faraday cage and then get a mini test obviously it won't be as full as if they've got the full environment but it should be enough to show whether the bag is at risk um, or, or working relatively well 
what's the risk there? Like a, a lot of the time in instant response and digital forensic, people buy these tools to test and calibrate. And then they're like, okay, we're sweet. And then no one ever tests the testing device to make sure that that testing device is actually telling them that their bag's fine. So is the proposal there as well for them? Like they're rotated out or is it just like they have to manage it themselves? Like how logistics wise has that been yeah. thought about? Uh, uh, it, it's point? a good question. So the idea is that the device will be part of a two set, one on the outside of the bag, one on the inside of the bag. And what we're proposing and what we're going to test mm -hmm. in the trials is whether having three is enough so you can kind of rotate in and do those checks with the third one that will do right. calibration kind of as a man in the middle. Um, we're not sure if that will be okay. enough or if there are other ways of doing it without a third device. But from initial checks, that that's where we're thinking. Mm. Okay. That's and they'll all be cool. Raspberry Pi based. So as long as as long as we can get Raspberry Pis, we'll mm. be fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, as long as there's not a massive demand again and you can't get one for like eleven months. Yeah, I heard I heard from my brother in law that they're back in stock now because he's just bought one. <laughs> um I, I hear graphics cards are on their way out again this oh, morning. No. Um apparently there is a huge demand now for those for AI as opposed to for Bitcoin mining, but you know, mm. there we go. Um but Southampton's very interesting in that um, as an enterprise university, they actually have, um, you know, the capability to do things. Um, and Sarah is director of enterprise uh, for the School of uh, Electronics and Computer Science. So what, what exactly is that doing? Uh, so one of the things that really attracted me to Southampton is that it's, you're right, it's not that traditional academic theory um, based culture. We have a triple helix that is really important and embedded in everything we do, where we look at education, research and enterprise. So everything we're looking at, we're trying to have that real world impact as we go. And enterprise activity, that can be everything from general consultancy to the kind of case like I do is actively encouraged. We want things that are directly helping the world. And I, I think that's fabulous. So my role as director of enterprise is to bring all my experience from my advisories, my casework, to help those in the school who want to build up more of an enterprise portfolio in whatever shape that that makes sense for their discipline. That's that's interesting because it's, it's often a kind of topic that Sai and I talk about a lot where we find there, especially like as we both go to conferences, there's always a disconnect between a university doing research and they're putting it out and you're like, oh, this was in a tech blog five years ago. Like, what, how is this novel to them? But it's just because it wasn't in the literature. How, like, from your perspective, how do you find that that is across other universities or other places? Or is this something that is quite new within the UK because that even over in Australia like I can probably only think of maybe one or two universities that would be doing something similar but on a very small scale in a very niche area within sure. cyber um I mean like the practitioners you know as, as a practitioner myself I can find it oh, it says app not in focus so as a practitioner I can find it quite frustrating at times when some of my more academic colleagues come along with great theoretical solutions that just wouldn't be practical for, for a variety of reasons in the real world. Mm. Um, I was really lucky that when I started, I was straight in with Tony and Brian and doing... Sorry, let's yeah. just chuck some context into this. Tony, uh, Tony Sams and Brian Jenkinson uh, were professors of forensic computing at Cranfield. Um, and they basically were the foundation of the entire field of digital forensics in the UK. I think that's yeah. a fair a fair approximation, isn't it? Um, and um, apart from being absolutely wonderful people and human beings and um, incredibly knowledgeable about it, they, they were uh, in at the beginning. Um, Tony... Tony wrote the paper on the Telnet protocol when the internet was invented, which is kind of cool. And Brian was head of Cambridge Fraud Squad for a long time 
well, fraud was still done on paper, and then when computers came in, got into it that way. So they are, you know, hugely knowledgeable people who who came to to set up the first ever forensic computing department in the UK. So when we're talking about Tony and Brian, that's who we mean. <laughs> um, we both we both trained under them, and they had a certain ethos and je ne sais quoi in the way that they delivered, um, which uh, you know I think lives on in all who have have been. <laughs> been lucky enough to have, uh, have have met and been been educated it, by them so anyway i apologize for interrupting no, but no, that, no. We'll, we'll just put that clarification <laughs> in um no i i completely agree with you and i think in the uk certainly when i started being trained by tony and brian you know it was and it still is a really good marker for if you survived their courses you know your stuff and i think jeff fellows angle as well giving you that defense and that slightly different spin was also super super useful but the one thing tony and brian made very clear to me from day one was if i wanted to be an academic in this field and if i really wanted to make a difference i had to do casework and i was just really lucky that at shrivenham that was something we were encouraged to do from the beginning um so i started as you do as an acquisition officer getting the data off and helping with little bits like that. And then moving on to doing solo casework. And as I say, there are a variety of casework types. So I, I think it really does make a difference, not just in the way I approach the research, but when I'm talking with the advisories and also when I'm talking to other practitioners, you know, being able to give your war stories, being able to justify when they're going, well, why on earth would I consider this? Being able to put it in that context of you really understand and get it such a key difference and something i'd recommend when you talk about practitioners there I, I, i'm interested in understanding what the general pathway is like are they students that are coming through the program and they're becoming academic and practitioners themselves or are they more from industry coming in doing research like which is the, um, the majority so for me i do both um so with you know, for the past 15 years, mostly I've, I've focused on practitioners, but now I'm at Southampton. Uh, we have undergraduate and master's programs that are part of our NCSC Academic Center of Excellence. So um, they're all accredited courses mm -hmm. in cybersecurity. So I'm adding the digital forensics kind of flavor to those. But Cy and I are also setting up some brand new short courses that will, like my previous work, all be practitioner focused. So some of those will be entry level for people going mm -hmm. in, but I'm very much of the opinion that this field moves too quick and there's too much to know that, you know, we need to focus on CPD for those that are there as well. So everyone and anyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was actually just reading your, what Sai sent me over your website before, um, and I was having a look through <laughs> uh, your research outputs and the, the top one in 2023 caught my eye. And as I was scrolling through it, I love the like the very end, and and we'll post all the links for the listeners and viewers to to look at this. Um, but it was like summing up. Uh, oh, I I guess I'll give the title. So we're making a list, checking it twice, going to find out what makes digital forensic examiners suffice. I, I love the rhyming there. Uh, and then at the end, it was just like, therefore, in answer to the question, are you an expert? The answer is it depends, uh, which is my favorite. DFIR quote, when anyone asks you anything, you're like, it depends. And then you can kind of spiel into it. But um, maybe you could like cover off a little bit of what prompted doing that paper. And then uh, I guess the what you found from, from all the research from it. Oh, uh, so I mean, the, the paper really came about from, um, I, so I'm now on a number of advisories, you know, um, and I, I get out a lot and in my new role at Southampton, it, it's kind of very key that I'm dealing with industry um, across all sectors, not just digital forensics. And I'm seeing that practitioner academic distance happening more and more. But also as we shift in digital forensics to in the UK, the forensic science regulator things coming in, there's more and more discussions about what makes competency in digital forensics, what makes an expert. and this was really a bunch of us that are practitioners who've been doing it for a long, long time. I think um, the shortest on that paper is about five years, but most have over 10 years experience doing casework in the field. 
it was a discussion on what we felt the key skills were, what we'd seen evolve as it was coming through, and really looking at the literature and how that kind of supported what what we could pull out. Um, and I, th I think it was just, you know, one of those, we felt it needed to be published. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, so certainly looking at, at, at what gets published as a whole, there's a lot of stuff that comes out about... And as you pointed out, some of it are quite delayed, but it's a lot of stuff that comes out about technical aspects. And there's a lot less that comes out about not necessarily philosophical aspects, but things like what is an expert? What is privacy? What is, you know, <laughs> what is the acceptable relationship between defence and prosecution? You know, all of these things that are inherent in the concept of providing a fair trial and the industry or certainly academia seems very very focused on or digital forensics academia seems very focused on uh, the technical aspects and doesn't engage enough with the social sciences and the other aspects to um to to, to push it forward so the fact that you know you are in a position a, to, to write papers like this, but also, you know, you're on the biometrics and forensic ethics group. The idea that the government actually has an ethical consulting group to, to go to to ask about these things. Not, with no offence to the group, but not that they seem to be listening to you. Um, but, you know, <laughs> the theory at least is is good. How have you found the the process of engaging with government at such a a level i mean you know i've not done it so i have no idea um well i mean it, it's a great honor to be invited onto the group anyway and um mark watson gandhi who is head of uh, the beef egg group is the most amazing barrister i think i've ever met he is like tigger when he talks about geek things and yet his primary area of advocacy is insolvency law related stuff um, but he's an absolute delight to work with. And the kind of challenges that we get presented with, the kind of conversations we get to have, it's really nice to have. But I think like ethics discussions across the board, one of the things you see, you know, we, we see it all the time at university. Students will come to you with ethics when they've already made their mind up about a solution and then trying to embed ethics into it. What as BFEG we're really working on um, and you know, at, and at Southampton as well, is that real, can we embed ethics as we go, as you should with ethics as a problem? Um, but yeah, whilst, whilst I can't talk for, for beef egg, my, my experience of it has been amazing. Uh, just so many cool people and so much interest in making the world a better place. Absolutely. So that's at a, a government level, is it, that, that ethics committee comes together to try and advise the government on ethical decisions around tech uh, and... so i mean if you look at the bfeg website the kind of things that bfeg's commissioned for come from all over but it's primarily related to home office and people who come in and query it um there's a lot more goes on than obviously i get involved in but um yeah it's a it's a, it's a good group and it's it's very well known um, and it takes on its own commissions as well, not just those that are given to it. So things that the members are passionate about, which I think is really important. The British government has been quite proactive recently, I think, is, is, is fair to say, in starting to to set up some of these these, these groups. I don't know how long. I, biometrics, I remember seeing the, the the call for members going out, which I, I, I mean, that was it could only have been a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know if it was around longer than that, um, but yes, it, it, and, and and you know, working within the Home Office, the Home Office deals with all of the policing and um, that well, basically the Home, so the UK uh, administrative stuff, as opposed to the Foreign Office, which deals with stuff elsewhere, um, and <clears throat> it's marginally less concerned about ethics. I think I don't know. <laughs> That's where James Bond lives, so probably. Um, so. Uh, okay, well, I mean, I'm going to say the other the other thing that I, I'm I'm very intrigued about because something that you know infinitely more about than I do, and I've started to see the labs coming together is that you do so much 
truly low level forensics like chip off scraping away things and resoldering stuff to be able to access things a how did you get into this well actually why did you get into this how did you get into this and where's it going it, it yeah okay um the why well um in the UK, when I was younger, which is starting to feel like an absolute eternity ago, as as a woman, uh, you know, when it came to design and technology lessons, electronics and woodwork and things were frowned upon uh, still. So whilst we did a little bit on rotation, when it came to options later on, if you even suggested it, you were very much pushed towards cookery and things. So it always felt that little bit out of reach um, and, and yet something that when I tried it was really exciting and I was really good at um, compared to cookery, which I usually suck. But um, anyway, so I did computer science, which again, you know, when I did my degree, I was one of a very small number of women. I mostly sat in rooms just full of men. And so there, there wasn't really that kind of option. But when we were doing some stuff, uh, not long after I'd taken over the group, we, we got some options to do some more electronics things. And in the workshops at the time at Shrivenham, the head of electronics was a woman called Stacy. Uh, we actually have a couple of papers together on chip off. And she was very passionate about it. And she let me sit in the workshops and kind of learn and gave me some kits to learn. and. I just found it fascinating as the, the rest of the team having this opportunity to learn. Things were becoming more embedded. So for me, strategically, it made sense that at some point we were going to need the multidisciplinary skill set. So why not get ahead of the curve? And now I'm at Southampton, you know, it's electronics and computer science, which is amazing because no one kind of defines themselves as one or the other everyone can look at everyone's notes everyone can use the facilities across the board um and and now there's just so many opportunities to kind of increase that knowledge and grow like the first thing they did was put a full electronics bench in my office which i think was brave of them considering the number of times the building has burnt down <laughs> already but um you know so yeah we've kitted the lab out in the same vein i very much believe that we should have those facilities i'm not saying everyone will do everything uh certainly people will have niches and things they're more interested in but the facilities should be there and people should have the opportunity regardless of who they are to to go where they want to go no i think i think chip off is Fun. is absolutely fascinating i must admit i'm 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 i can't wait to be handheld through it through a course to come and listen and, and to learn so that's 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 really exciting now i we've we sort of talked about brian and tony and and um and, and the course now that you've also uh presented um i know to the bcs in the uk um i saw you present at the um the uk teaching forensics conference um your approach to teaching is beautifully insane thank you um <laughs> You're, you're welcome. Um, it's creative and novel. And do you want to talk us through that? Because I do actually think it's genius. So, you know. Well, that, that's good considering you've agreed to work with me. Otherwise, this, this probably wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's no secret. I spent a couple of years as a high school teacher before I did my PhD. Um because at that time, so I'd had a number of bereavements on the degree and a careers advisor thought that would be a good place to go and get myself mentally together. Uh, in retrospect, that's probably not where you put someone if you want them to kind of sort their, themselves out. But I love teaching and I loved engaging. And one of the things teacher training taught me other than the teacher stare, which is so useful when you've got law enforcement in the room, so, so useful, um, is about the fact that they were saying, oh, you've got to use the, the popular culture references. You've got to do it this way. And I found that wasn't working for me. And I found very quickly that when I engaged with the students in a way that worked for me and was fun for me, but also took into account them. So, for example, I had the most 
adorable year seven class and we learned PowerPoint sounds with Old MacDonald because that worked for us as a room. I don't think it would have necessarily worked for every other teacher, but for that combination of students and, and me, that was the right way to go. And we had a great lesson and the observer was shocked because they were like, oh, it doesn't involve top trumps or whatever, you know, the, the craze was at the time. I've kind of followed that through and, you know, watching Tony and Brian do their crazy scenarios and they got dressed up and they got very into it. I'm not an actor. I'm a geek. So we, we've gone a bit more virtual, but doing the same kind of crazy gamified. Every module is a scenario. So we've now got this wonderful world called Cyberly um, that is this technology hub and it's got all these wonderful buildings, everything from uh, a zoo to a um, offshoot of Santa's, um, you know, workshop to, to all sorts, bowling alley, uh, museums, you name it. And we've got a mock detective agency called Bytes and a set of villains called Villainous Ventures Incorporated. And they get away every module, like some kind of Scooby-Doo, Inspector Gadget style villain, you know, always at the end, like, oh, we'll get you next time, Bytes. And it's just this gamified, like you say, chaos. But when you go in the room and you kind of do that tiggery, bouncy, how I lecture, I know no other way, um, and you instill that energy and you make it fun and it's not too close to the kind of casework that they're doing, the students get so excited. So I've had practitioners who you know, I've been doing the job years and years and we've had vampire serial killers and they'll still, when they see me and we're, you know, having chats, they'll go, oh, I remember the Oliver Duncan case and the, you know, vampire serial killer. And I, I just, I think it's so much better mental health wise and for fun and really ensuring that we're focusing on the technical, not anything that's going to trigger or make it, you know, too, too dark, I guess. It, I, I mean, I think it's brilliant, and it, I mean, I remember, funnily enough, when I went for to to interview for the for the position, not for the position, for the place on the on the Cranfield, I had a, I had a very serious talk with, um, oh, I can't remember who it was now, but but somebody sat me down and went, look, are you really really sure you want to get into this because this is the sort of thing you'll be dealing with, but that doesn't mean you have to keep reinforcing that at every stage during the lectures you know after after somebody has acknowledged and especially for these police officers who quite possibly have already been doing this for some time um to to take them out and and um and, and give them something else is uh, is hugely valuable but i mean i think i think you've gone about it in a a way above and beyond because you I, you've made a lot of use of things like uh, the Adobe Suite for creating characters and voices. You've gone to the extent... I mean, the, the script writing is great. There's there's a lovely... Um, I saw it in the demo of um, uh, at Warwick. One of the things that you end up doing is phoning the IT help desk during this, this process. And then it just rings out. Just like phoning a real IT help desk. <laughs> <laughs> So you know it, it is it is it is brilliantly conceived and uh, and an absolutely wonderful way of doing. It. But actually, as a as an overall, um, it's not pedagogical because that's teaching children. But the whatever the adult equivalent is, that the the actual whole approach to it is 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 incredibly well thought out and really you know brilliant. And I think I think it's something that um, that we should look at instigating wider afield for for for, for forensics because I think it's. Um, it's important it, because it doesn't restrict you in getting the technical concepts across. If anything else, actually, yeah. it enables you to create a stupid, amazing scenario whereby you can throw technology at it in a way that would never actually stick in the real world, um, so that people can uh, can do it. And it only gets richer as as time goes on as well, which I I, I think is brilliant. I think that's a good good saying though. Like it kind of is for kids i always when i create content or i'm doing content and it's stuff that i really enjoy i always like to say treat me like an intelligent five-year-old that just go back to basics and and step me through like especially if it's learning but yeah <laughs> it's just just reminding me of a story i told told my my daughter the other day um 
my 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 eldest just uh, interviewed for a job and she she felt that the interview had gone terribly and um she was really depressed about it uh, but in fact she's got the job and she's she's doing brilliantly um <laughs> so so that's that's great but she but the time she's with me I mean, said, look 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 you know i actually went to an interview and i basically told the interviewer that his children were stupid and they still offered me the job so i wouldn't worry about it too much but he was like during the interview, he was like, "Could you explain this concept?" It was VPNs. He said, "Could you explain this concept as if you were explaining it to a to an eight year old?" Um, and I had two uh, two kids. One was eight. One was six at the time. Um, and I explained it as I would have explained it to my children. And he went, "I'm not sure an eight year old would have understood that." My, he's, I'm not sure my eight year old would have understood that. And I said, "Well, mine would have." So <laughs> 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 anyway, <clears throat> so yeah. They still offer me the job, so I must have done something else right during that interview. Um, but yeah, so uh, so all good there. But no, I, I I think I think that's brilliant, and um, it's really exciting to 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 actually be part of that. And everybody seems to love it. Anytime you talk about it, everybody seems to love it, which is is clearly a a, a great thing. Oh, and actually, while we were talking about content, that Des, sorry, I'm just slide this one. And we've done our free advertising. Let's get Des's in. Um, while we're talking about content creation, um, Desi uh, has his own uh, other podcast called uh, Nearly Adequate. Sorry, I'm going to I've got to go back and check. Hard, hardly, hardly adequate. Is, hardly adequate. Is my other podcast. Um, yeah, and we will put links in the show notes to that because it is great fun, and I thoroughly recommend that you go and listen to it. Yeah, less less digital forensics focus. So the the I avoid overlap. I bring the guests for digital forensics here. Uh, and then cyber general instant response is on the other one. Um, and the Discord channel is fascinating uh, as an experience. Lots of crabs. Lots of crabs. Um, way more crabs mm. than I was expecting. Okay. Um, I'm So just like, I guess, a, another slight plug for the podcast, but I've been doing a lot of human interest stories where I just interview people about um, their pathway into this, like kind of, kind of like this interview where we get to know people and, and that. And one of the questions I always ask is like, what are your side hobbies? And there's some very interesting responses I get from people's side hobbies. Like I found out one of my friends was at one point really into breeding rare tropical shrimp, uh, which I didn't even realize was a thing. And people send them in, in the mail, like oh. just in sealed letters that have like a little bit of water in them and stuff. And I was just like, what? There's like shrimp in the mail? But yeah, weird stuff. But I, I guess that's a question for you, Sarah. Like, do you have any weird and wonderful hobbies other than creating all these vampire serial killer scenarios? Um, well, I like drawing, um, and I like going out exploring places. But because of obviously what I do and being a geek, I don't like having my photo taken. So, in a bid to have fun, and he's, mm -hmm. he's lingering off stage. But um, Smudge here gets in all the photos. So there's a photo of him at the BBC <laughs> studios nice. and on a Canon. And no matter where I go, he has a fun photo taken and has an Instagram page with over a thousand followers. They're all like watching what Smudge gets up to. <laughs> oh, wow. we, will, we, will, we will link to this because I didn't <laughs> know this existed and I will be joining it. <laughs> so that's fine. Um, that's fantastic. Yes, Smudge. I, I saw. I saw you sent me directly, but I saw I saw that he was in uh, in, in Liverpool the other day doing Beatles things. Yeah. So. <laughs> does Does Smudge have a story? Like, how did how did Smudge come um, about? Well, so you know, teddy bears everywhere. Anyway, but um, it was one of those things where mm -hmm. I was just trying to have a bit more fun when I was out. Uh, not long after, I found out I was autistic, and I yeah you know, like going out alone. And I, I wanted to make it more fun, but I did not want to be in the photos like everyone else. So I put him on a cannon mm. at Edinburgh Castle and then it kind of grew. And now he goes on the school outreaches and everyone knows Smudge and asks more about what he's up to than what I'm up to. And I don't know if I should be offended. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, he's yeah, got exactly. an Instagram. Like, that's that's probably why everyone's following <laughs> his life. <laughs> I think awesome. Um, I mean, just sort of you've you've mentioned it, and and I know we've we've talked about it a, a little, um, but there are two things that you've you've mentioned in this. One is is that um, you've said as a woman, 
um, you found that things are very difficult. And I know certainly for a couple of my students, they found you very inspirational. Um, Sarah and Jenny have both both said that you know you were were hugely inspirational to them and 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 feel that way. But you've also involved uh, in in plenty of women in STEM and 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 other outreach programs like that. And also, you said you know you're you're, you're autistic, and you you've you've mentioned to me that you like to help other people feel that they can do things. Um, it, it's not a label that should be. Um, be put on someone in any negative capacity can you tell us a, a little more about that in a way that's good yeah, for you yeah sure um so i mean oh for a long time i was beating myself up that there are some things i struggle with and other things like maths and computer stuff that seems to come i'm told easier than for some other people and i thought it was just me and i thought i was useless and we, we've got short staffing at work and I was getting very anxious. So, you know, they had me on meds and things for anxiety. And it, it took a few years before someone even broached that maybe anxiety was a, a symptom rather than the actual problem and that maybe I might be autistic. And I was mid thirties and I, I felt like someone had just punched me in the gut because I did not really know what it was. Um, I'd got this kind of image of Sheldon Cooper in my head from the Big Bang Theory. And I thought, oh my God, I am that different. I'm, you know, like that. that's it, I'm screwed. Um, and, you know, it, it, it took a lot of going through all the testing, learning about it to realize it's it's really not that bad. It just means I think differently. It means I have different strengths. Um, turns out I can be quite creative and quite unique in that way. And as we've shown with the teaching, that can come in super useful. Um, but the one thing I wish I'd have known, like being a woman and having access to electronics, was that this is okay when I was younger. You know, I wish I'd seen more people with it and maybe someone would have noticed sooner or maybe I might have had a clue that it's okay to struggle with these things or be different. So all of my outreach, all of, you know, when I'm posting about it on Twitter is just trying to normalize the fact that this, this is okay. You know, it, it's okay to be different. And look, I'm not even 40 yet. And I'm a professor at a Russell group living my best life and my dream. So, you know, it, it doesn't hold you back. It's actually quite cool. It's Oh, good stuff. So what's, uh, what's, what's, I mean, obviously, you know, setting up the department, but anything else exciting on the research radar that you and I have talked about that we haven't Ooh, mentioned yet? Well, you know, setting up the new labs and we're going to have a opening for that. We've got a beautiful new crime scene room that I'm so excited about. Um, although the mannequins are starting to scare people in my office, so we might have to move those. Um, <laughs> and we've got a big research lab, a casework lab, um, and far too much as so I mentioned electronics kit. It felt like Christmas opening all those boxes. Um, we're doing a crime scene app research project, which is more, I think it's going to have some CSI use, but also more your private investigator market um, in terms of making evidentially, evidentially sound photos um, that can easily be viewed. So kind of a spin off of an EWF container. Um, what else are we up to? A lot more mental health work, actually. I've seen a lot of practitioners I care about have time off over the past couple of years. And um, one tragically uh, gave up his life. And I, I just feel like we're not talking about mental health in this space enough. So that's that's a big thing we're doing. Um, on the chatty IoT. So we're doing a lot of things about network traffic and smart fridges you know because it's a step away from a washing machine it's <laughs> so yeah covering all the weird things that was the, that was the only that was the only other thing Sai sent me before we started this was he was like uh she's done a forensic analysis of a washing machine and so if we hadn't brought that up i was definitely going to bring that up because that sounds interesting i'm sorry i apologize <laughs> Was it a smart? Was it a smart washing machine? It was. Is that why? 
was it linked to a crime? Is yeah, that so also it why? was um, in Europe, not a UK case. Um, someone had done something quite bad, and there was no real CCTV or witnesses, and you know, not not enough. But they'd got intelligence; they knew who they wanted, so went round to their place. A uh, person was alone, had like all these people lost their mobile phone. Um, as I say, no one else there, and produced a pile of wet laundry and said I was at home doing my washing. And some person decided to seize the washing machine. Um, and then no, no one knew what to do with it, but they knew that it could be turned on with a mobile phone. <laughs> so one of the people I had trained uh. and they thought I might know and called me up Sunday afternoon and said, would you like to do one? And I genuinely thought it was a joke. So I said, of course I will analyze your washing machine until it arrived at the lab, um, which was a difficult thing to explain. <laughs> and then we had a look, but because the washing machine had an embedded board and we couldn't find a way of acquiring it, mm. the JTAG ports had been completely destroyed. Um, we had to do chip off anyway. And it used all kinds of bespoke things on the, the chip. So we ended up going through goodness knows how many washing machines doing small reverse engineering style experiments to work out, you know, if we just set it going with the phone, if we set it going with the buttons, what we can get. So I had what felt like a washing machine graveyard, um, not the most environmentally friendly case I've ever done, and managed to reverse it to prove it was turned on with the phone. And we could show there was a unique GUID for each phone attached. So we could show the phone. Uh, then eventually they recovered the phone, could prove that it was definitely that phone and prove that that phone wasn't on the local Wi-Fi. And um, yeah. That's super interesting. But the interesting. scary yeah. thing about the washing machine was it was recording how long from when the cycle had finished till you pressed to open the door which I feel like is really making me feel bad about the length of time it takes me when I do my washing you know, <laughs> to actually go down and <laughs> seem an unnecessary thing to store. I thought, I thought you were just going to talk about privacy or something, but you're just feeling judged so by judged, the washing machine. I am so judged. Um... Oh, I am <laughs> deeply disturbed because I am incredibly good at putting things on and then forgetting about them and then going back and then putting oh, them on again because they, by the time that. I get around to them, oh. they really need so, it. Yeah, it it flight. Yeah, I've done that lots. Where I've had to do two loads of washing on the same load because I've left it overnight and it kind of. No, stinks. three yeah. models we looked at yeah. flagged if you ran a load twice without like um changing, so the weight hadn't changed in the drum. Which again, you know, it's just <laughs> it's weighing your laundry. Well, actually, I know mine weighs my laundry because it then calculates in theory how much water it should use. But I hope it's dumber than that because um. Yeah, it doesn't. I can't turn it on with my phone. Um, wow. Yeah. No. You know, I'm just concerned that like, like I'm getting YouTube statistics sent back to Samsung from my washing machine, and they're just like looking at my report and they're like, "Oh, Alex is a lazy piece of shit. He keeps doing two loads of washing on the same load. He's not hanging it out." Someone in Korea is judging me for sure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You and me mm. both. So. Uh... <laughs> Oh dear. Right. Well, I think that that's a good note to end on now. We're all embarrassed about our um our capabilities. Yeah, washing habits. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, at least we're putting it in the washing machine. I suppose there's yeah. there's an upside. <laughs> <laughs> um Sarah, thank, thank you so you. much uh for coming on and talking to us and um there will definitely be updates um uh, coming onto the channel as to what's happening at Southampton. Uh, now I am fortunately and formally uh, actually uh, announced as a as a member of the team, which is wonderful and really exciting. And sooner or later, I might get an email address, so that would be great. One step um, at a time, so. It's making me, feel, yeah, <laughs> it's making me feel feel jealous. I feel like I want to come over and like oh, study there you, now. Anytime, it sounds awesome with all anytime. those labs. So. And some of it will yep. be online as well, so you're more than welcome oh. to see the chaos online. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be sick. So um, 
So, yes, uh, in summary and by way of conclusion, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for everyone who's listening. We are available on all the usual channels, Apple Pod thingy, Spotify. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, I think iHeartRadio. Pretty much anywhere you get your podcasts from. YouTube. Um, yeah, YouTube on the Forensic well. Focus website, that that thing that we, you know, we were actually mm-hmm. here for. Um, and... To point out there's transcripts on the website as well for accessibility yes for those that and that want to read sometimes it. they're entirely accurate my my, <laughs> my favorite one was yeah. was early on um i said that i was a, a, a sys admin um as in systems and they had me down as sys as in cis as whatever the the gender thing is now <laughs> <laughs> so i was a sys admin which i thought was great um but I did have it corrected nonetheless. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you very much, everybody. We will talk to you uh, soon. We have upcoming podcasts with uh, Gavin and... Oh, crikey. Who's your friend, Des? Oh, Salim. Salim, yeah. yes. On, getting, yep. on changing into uh, the industry and uh, later education in life. Um, we have an upcoming podcast with somebody else who you arranged for next week, so I can't tell you who it is. Yeah, so uh, B-Sides presentation, Ryan Williams is coming on to chat about hacking SS7, which is essentially the uh, what BGP is to the internet is SS7 is to mobile phones and networks um, with a focus on trying to help domestic abuse uh, victims. So that'll be... Um, his talk was amazing Like when I saw it, so it'll be really exciting to have him on. Yeah. So uh, so we will be back. Um, we, we've, we've sort of been a, a little away for, for a time. Not that you will have noticed because we had stuff in the in the bank, but, you know, <laughs> Shh, we are... We, don't tell <laughs> That's it. Just how the sausages are made. Um, but it is all good. <laughs> it is all good. And we are, we, are, we are all still here and we are all still producing new content. So we will catch you soon. Thank you very much for joining us. Take care. Thanks all.